Okay, let me monitor it on YouTube also. Okay, so um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone since it's all remote now and uh, people are joining from different places. So um, I hope everybody is having a good day so far. Uh, thank you for joining us. Today, today's session is pretty interesting. Uh, uh, we have a very good friend of mine, but that's not why I invited him. He is also a very prolific researcher editor and one of the most active reviewers uh, in my circle, um, Professor Stan Evanov from Varna University of Management, which is in Bulgaria. So I know Professor Stan from what, like maybe six years or something now. And um, he has been an incredible friend, um, never said no to me, whatever I've requested him to do for uh, research and my channel and everything. So thank you, Stan, for uh, accepting this invitation as well. Um, today's session um, is a live session. Uh, the idea is actually to talk about reviewing papers. And um, why did I come up with this idea was based on a lot of discussions that I had with many people, including Stan. In Malaysia, last time when we met, we talked about these things as well. Um, I personally believe that um, we as a scholarly community do not do enough to train people to review papers. Um, in fact, earlier I was talking to Stan uh, that when universities are preparing students, uh, they mainly focus on research or teaching, but then all of us um, have to write papers and those papers go to journals and then journals keep send those papers to reviewers. So um, entirely our research depends on the gatekeepers who are the reviewers. But then uh, most of the times, well, I, I don't, I won't say most of the times, but many times we get good reviews, but then many times we don't really get good reviews. So uh, the idea for today's session was to talk about um, how to review a paper um, and who better than Stan to talk about this because not only he is an active reviewer, but also an editor and very dangerous editor when it comes to plagiarism. So, uh, all right, so thank you, Stan, again. Um, uh, would you thank want you. to say a couple of words? Well, thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, I hope that sharing ideas about the review process will be helpful for all participants in this session. Thank you. Uh, so um, those of you who are watching uh, live, you can use YouTube chat feature to ask any questions that you have about reviewing. A little bit about Stan, obviously, uh, some of you may know him. Um, he is uh, um, currently um, in Warner University of Management. He also holds a position. Um, or I don't know if you are um, currently uh, vice rector for research then, or if yes, you are still yes. currently vice rector for research for Warner University of Management. Um, and a professor, uh, plus uh, editor in chief for a European Journal of um, Tourism Research. And recently, he started another journal called Robonomics. Exactly. Is, is that Robonomics. The, Robonomics? Robonomics. And he also got some submissions for that journal. So if you are working in robotics and stuff like this, maybe consider submitting your uh, manuscript to Stan's journal. Um, so that's a little bit about Stan. Uh, we will directly start with the question. So um, I have a few questions, Stan, before you talk about how do you review papers or some tips, and I'll go with those uh, few basic questions that I have. Um, the first question, so if we are preaching reviewing, what is the or what are the benefits of reviewing in your opinion? Well, um, to participate in the review process is uh, of great benefit for the reviewers. Obviously, it takes time. So this is the cost. It takes time. Reviewing, reviewing a paper can be as uh, short as 30 minutes if the paper, it will be very bad and it will be rejected. But it, it can take more than two hours if it is a longer paper and it needs uh, greater scrutiny. However, it, uh, uh, the benefit for the reviewer is that uh, the reviewer can uh, see uh, what is the current stage of research even before it is published. It can, it can generate ideas, uh, it can 
uh, and also and also review uh, by reviewing a paper you can uh, you can put yourself in the shoes of the reviewers so that when you write papers by yourself you can uh, you can uh, also you can start thinking as a reviewer and uh, because we should not forget that the reviewers are the second group of people who will read our paper the first this is the editor the second this is the reviewers and on the basis of their decision our paper uh, will be published so uh, practically it helps a lot to be part uh, to be a reviewer because uh, you can uh, see how reviewers think and uh, you can have this uh, mindset critical attitude towards <laughs> towards your own publications right so um stan you talked about um uh, something for um, review and you said that as a reviewer you get to know about the new research and i completely agree to this sometimes it's so interesting because you don't know whose review paper are you reviewing right so sometimes it can be leading scholars in the field and they might be writing some very good research piece it doesn't mean that you copy their research but it gives you an idea for um, your own research and it happened to me several times um, in fact i recently got to know that one paper that i reviewed for um, a journal uh, from uh, uh, my good friend Levent, um, Service Industries Journal, which later got published and I also now got to know the authors, uh, inspired me to do a couple of research papers, al also accepted. Very, so it's, it's, it's one of, in my opinion, one of the major, major benefits mm -hmm. is that you get to know the latest, really latest research in the field. Mm -hmm. So very good point. All right, so um, obviously, Stan, just like anything else, I don't think that review is also all positive right so when you are reviewing papers there might be some limitations or some disadvantages as well so in your opinion what are some of those disadvantages when you are reviewing papers well from my perspective uh, the disadvantage in reviewing paper for the reviewer for the reviewer it's uh, only the time because uh, that you that you invest there because uh, um, the review process is double blind, you are anonymous, and uh, um, practically the other costs that are involved uh, for you as a reviewer uh, do, not, do not exist, at least, at least in my mind. In my mind, it's uh, mostly the positive. That's why I review a lot. Okay, so that also makes sense. Now, uh, Stan, because you are an editor, right? So I have actually two questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, let's say we have some young scholars about to finish mm -hmm. their PhD, or I don't know how do you feel about having PhD students as reviewers. Uh, how can one young researcher become a reviewer? Like, should they approach the editor? Or what, what do they need to do to become a reviewer? Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a fantastic question. Um, journals al always lack sufficient number of reviewers. The more reviewers uh, that we have uh, available, the better, because this will decrease the workload for all reviewers. Um, so uh, young, research young researchers, what uh, I strongly recommend them is uh, uh, to make themselves available on the reviewer market. In the human language, this means uh, to make accounts in the journals in their submission systems and also to uh, to uh, to a point to point uh, explicitly that they are available as uh, reviewers this is important because in some systems you don't have uh, uh, this option by default but it is uh, opt in so by default you are an author but you have to explicitly mention that you will be that, that you are available as uh, a reviewer uh, so, uh, um, also to put which are the keywords, uh, um, uh, uh, papers from which field you would be interested to uh, to review. So, in that way, you show that you are available. Uh, this is the proactive, but also it's a largely hidden uh, process because the editors, they will not know that you are uh, available until they start searching for uh, reviewers in the system. The second, more again, proactive but more visible approach is uh, directly to write uh, the, to the editors. Uh, but first, again, you have to make uh, you have to be sure that you have already 
uh, um, register that you have already registered in the journal submission system. You have a complete profile there, and then uh, uh, you can inform the editor that uh, he or she can rely on you on reviewers in uh, uh, this or that field. So this All is right. important proactivity. Okay, so very good point, proactivity. One thing I want to add here, Stan, is um, most of the submission systems now also, when even as an author you are submitting your paper, you can opt to be a reviewer in the journal, right? So there's a question that says, would you yes. like to review? Um, and I've seen that there's a, a one problem is that many people, they put their profiles up as a PhD student, but then they do not update the profile, which is also very important. So maybe when you are a PhD student, you are working in, let's say, something called um, emotional stability of employees, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then after your PhD, now you want to work on, let's say, something else, employee stress or something else, right? So your research area changes. So it's a good idea also to go back and update your profile so that whenever a new paper comes into that new area that you're working on, you can get the review request for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's um, uh, one thing to consider. Um, Stan, one other question, okay? So, uh, you know, um, in research, just like any other field, right? Um, there's a lot of um, stereotypes. There's a lot of things that pass on from people to people or myths, I would call it. It's like, there's a lot of myths. One of them is um, uh, about reviewing that I hear so often, like on different support groups and um, different forums. People say that, uh, OK, when I submit a paper to a journal, OK, and then right after that or within a week or so, I get a review request from the same journal, right? Um, so should I accept it? Would it increase my chances of getting my own paper accepted in the journal? Have you heard something like this? How true is that? Well, uh, I can speak here from the three positions as, as an editor, as a reviewer, as an author. As an editor, um, as an editor, it is, uh, well, the European Journal of Tourism Research this year, we have 430, 440 submissions. Um, I would say that there is a relationship uh, between the submission and uh, the review uh, within a week or two. But probably, if you have sub, but if you have submitted a, uh, an article, you have to be ready to review. So definitely, you will be allocated as a reviewer. You will receive an invitation for this one. Probably not immediately within a couple of weeks, but probably in few months next year. That's absolutely possible. As a reviewer. I have experienced uh, I have experienced this, but I don't think that it is uh, a relationship because b between these because uh, uh, because I register uh, myself in the system, I, I create an account, I update it, and I submit a paper, so that uh, uh, the editor when uh, when the editor sees this, uh, um, I'm uh, uh, I don't think that there is a relationship between my sub previous submission. It is just because I, I received the invitation, just because I am already there and I have uh, created a, an updated uh, uh, profile. Um, um, and uh, as an author, uh, as an author, I have received uh, uh, invitations. I review for some journals. Uh, I, I write many reviews for some journals where I receive many rejections. Uh, so, uh, but for a few invitations, but I have published uh, main, uh, a lot there. So I personally think that this is really a myth uh, rather than uh, a reality. And uh, re uh, re reviewing for a journal uh, is not, uh, uh, at least from my perspective and my experience of um, um, dealing with uh, reviewing and uh, editing for 14 years. Um, I don't think that there is a relationship between these. The fact that you review a lot for a journal does not improve your your chances for of your current papers uh, that are there. All right. Thank you, Stan. So the other side now of the same myth, and this recently, and you know there's a group on Facebook called Reviewer 2 Must Be Stop, right? which yes, talks about a lot of fun stuff about reviewing. And recently, I saw somebody posted in that group saying that um, I recently submitted my, I, I don't remember the exact words, but the idea of the post was that I submitted a paper to a journal which was rejected. 
And now the editor asked me to review for the same journal. Is it ethical to do? Um, I don't. I don't see a problem. I don't see a problem on this because uh, it is possible that an article is uh, rejected and then you to receive uh, uh, something to review, uh, a paper to review because uh, you may because the paper may might have been rejected for countless reasons. It may be rejected because of plagiarism, methodological flaw or something else, but uh, uh, you may be invited to review the paper because you have strengths in other in uh, in a specific area for for that paper, probably because for the literature review or probably in the analysis, something that was not related to uh, the previous one. But uh, I, uh, as I said before, I have received many rejections for some journals, but I st still receive invitations from them and I still continue to uh, review for them. I don't see a problem here. Right, um, a, a very good point. So I just want to add something very quickly here. Um, and that is, I've seen this uh, talking to many uh, young researchers. Um, one thing to understand for everybody is that many times when the email that you get from the editor to review is a standard email. And normally that email comes from the system. It's a system generated email, right? Template based. So sometimes those uh, emails say that you are um, seen as an expert in this area or something mm -hmm. like this. And many young researchers take it in literal meanings. Uh, and that's why these type of questions come, right? So this question that I earlier told you uh, on that mm -hmm. forum, um, now I remember that that lady actually said that, how is it that the editor rejects my paper for being worthless? And then the next week, uh, the editor thinks I'm an expert and sends me a review request, right? So I think it's important to understand that uh, these re review requests come from your keywords that you uh, put into the system. So make sure that those are updated. And one thing is that maybe the reviewer, the editor may not know you in the start as a reviewer, right? Maybe the system suggests the editor or whatever. But if you provide good review and consistent reviews, maybe after three or four reviews, the editor will know you personally. And it happens to many of us where you get personal messages from editors, mm -hmm. like, can you get this review or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. very important to consider. Um, okay, Stan, I have a question from a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Andrea McNeil. Um, her question is, um, good morning. Is there a strategy you employ as a reviewer? As you review, as a new reviewer, how would you suggest I approach my first review? Okay, so a strategy you employ is, uh, so if I am the reviewer, how do I the, review the paper? So this is the way I understand the question. For the first so, time, yes. Uh, correct, yes, for the first time. So um, I, would I would suggest that we follow, um, uh, that we follow the three stages of the review process from the reviewer point of view. We have invitation, preparing the review, and then the post review uh, of this. So uh, when we receive the invitation, it is good to respond in a timely manner to it. So usually we have something like uh, one week to respond to the to the review invitation, but it's good to respond uh, uh, once we receive once we receive it. This is uh, it's better to give. Uh, uh, it, it's better to decline the invitation rather than uh, uh, rather than not respond at all. Uh, also, uh, uh, we, uh, when we receive the invitation, we need to see whether we can prepare this this review in a timely manner. So, if we have received, let's say, twenty eight days to prepare the review, just check the calendar and see whether this is feasible. Uh, what uh, what work we what work you have uh, planned uh, in your calendar, but also account for any other work that may come, and uh, so that there might be possible uh, delays. Look also at the uh, at uh, uh, at the con at uh, the paper, the content of the abstract, the field of the paper. Is it part of your expertise, or do you have the sufficient knowledge to provide constructive feedback? Um, and also be curious. Sometimes the topic might not be exactly uh, what uh, uh, what you are expert in, but you might be expert in the methodology. So uh, you you may you may be an uh, you may not be an expert in uh, in a particular field, but you are an expert in uh, structural equation modeling. So why not review the paper from that point, from methodological, so that you can. Uh, uh, 
so uh, this will also expand the uh, your own knowledge but then when you accept the invitation the actual review what i recommend you is the following what i do is uh, first i look uh, at uh, uh, at for, uh, first i check briefly the paper for about let's say five minutes uh, uh, and look for significant flaws directly go to the methodology so i see what is uh, uh, first of course first what is the aim and objective what needs to be done and then uh, uh, to see what uh, to see what is uh, the methodology whether this is relevant usually uh, you, uh, um, this is because uh, everything else everything else like uh, uh, having a stronger rationale in the introduction uh, having uh, more literature or uh, having some more discussion these things they can be rewritten but uh, uh, but if you have a flaw in the research design which uh, invalidates uh, the findings then practically the paper uh, the paper cannot be saved from sinking um, so if there are significant flaws in the research design then um, there's absolutely uh, then then it's um, the review process will be very easy um then uh, uh then i go deeply into the different uh, sections and i look for things that are um uh, for example in the introduction they need to be a strong theoretical rationale the aim and the objectives they need to go beyond uh, uh beyond the simple description the literature review needs to be let's say well structured with current literature uh, uh sometimes uh, what sometimes what i see is that uh let's say a paper is submitted in 2020 but the literature uh, but the most recent literature is from 2015 why because uh, uh because the literature review is taken directly from the phd thesis which was submitted in 2015 and the literature was not updated but five years are a long period in social sciences and many things uh, develop it needs to be updated also in the methodology uh if the research design is fine is there uh, sufficient transparency you know that when you go to a doctor you don't hide anything you show everything when you go to a lawyer you because the lawyer needs to uh, to build the defense on the basis of everything uh, but uh, uh, when you write the method and when you write the methodology you have to be extremely transparent regarding what was your research population how did you develop the questionnaire which platform you used how you distributed how you filtered out the non-relevant respondents what methods for data analysis did you use why did you use parametric and not non-parametric methods why you use these ones or the others etc they need to be uh, there needs to be huge transparency. Um, uh, then, uh, in the results, I'm looking whether the ta uh, whether uh, there's a well structured data. I'm probably too obsessed with this, uh, and uh, uh, I prefer data to be in uh, in table formats, well structured. Uh, also, there's no need to explain something uh, in uh, to repeat something in the text that is already available in the tables. Uh, it is good also to structure the results as uh, um, uh, the structure of the results to mirror the aim and to, uh, to mirror the objectives to mirror the literature review. Um, I look uh, also at uh, whether there is critical discussion. Critical discussion in uh, on uh, two levels. First, this is the le uh, first. This is narrow discussion in the narrow field of uh, the topic. So, if you write about to or if the paper is on robots in tourism, whether uh, this is uh, uh, I'm looking for a discussion on uh, with previous papers on robots in tourism, but then also for a discussion in the broader context of service robots, and then the bro the broadest field of let's say automation technologies, not necessarily related to um uh, two robots uh also and the conclusion where uh the conclusion it's good to provide a summary table uh, with the research questions with uh, the hypothesis uh also to have something like a hundred word uh um summary with with um a message with the theoretical contribution something like take home message so that when someone reads this to know uh what exactly is the theoretical contribution don't be shy we we don't need to be shy we need to write explicitly what is our contribution also what are the implications uh, limitations future research 
so this is uh, this is quite clear. Uh, so uh, um, then comes the the practical writing. So this is uh, checking and uh, um, this is the criteria. But the practical writing, um, um, the review, it's good to be sufficiently detailed. So if you have a twenty word uh, review, that's uh, that that's not acceptable. Even if the paper is fantastic and can be desk, it can be accepted in its current form. Uh, it's good that the review provides justification uh, about the theoretical contribution, that the literature review is uh, is uh, thorough, that the methodology is appropriate, that the analysis uh, has been sufficiently in depth, that, they, so that the theoretical contributions are justified, etc., etc. Um, but um, also, uh, when we, uh, but also, uh, um, the review needs to give um, constructive comments constructive comments and I emphasize on the word constructive because uh, uh, every paper can be rejected. There's no such thing as a paper cannot be rejected uh, uh, they, uh, because there are always areas of improvement of on anything. Uh, but uh, the question is um, whether these uh, uh, um, whether the uh, which improvements to be made, so that the paper can be uh, um, the quality of the paper can be improved and the paper itself can be published. Here, uh, the way of expression is very uh, um, is very important. Uh, when I write my uh, reviews, I try to apply the so-called sandwich strategy, which means I start with uh, uh, with uh, general comments, general uh, general comments, general positive. I emphasize the positive sides. Then I give uh, uh, some uh, areas for improvement. Uh, they can be sometimes they are in just bullet for in uh, bullet form. Others time which are quite um, generic. Otherwise, uh, like the paper needs proofreading. While others will go very deeply into uh, justification about the justification of the methodology or uh, uh, the literature review. Uh, then uh, and then at the end there will be also some. Uh, I also try to have some um, positive uh, thing, <laughs> even if it is even if the paper is going to be uh, rejected, because at the end of the, at the end of the day we are all human uh, beings, and uh, it's good uh, it's good the writing to be how to say uh, to be based on facts, to be based on uh, what. Uh, uh, um, if we criticize, when we criti criticize, because we, we, we need to, uh, to have a critical approach to the paper, when we, provide, uh, when we provide critical feedback, we provide feedback to the material, to the paper. We do not provide, we do not criticize the personality of the author. So we cannot say that uh, the authors are incompetent, uh, they have not done a good job on this or that. We can, but uh, we focus on the material. So we uh, we, we we focus on the paper, not on the personality of the person of uh, of the authors. Uh, this is important because authors often uh, perceive uh, uh, the feedback, uh, the negative feedback, as uh, focusing on them rather than uh, the paper. I remember, for example, the first time I submitted a paper to uh, an international journal. It was in 2004. I submitted it to Annals of Tourism Research. And I received three reviews, 24 reasons for rejection. When I read uh, the reviews, I was uh, like crazy. I thought, uh, what are they writing? Why do they criticize me in that way? Uh, but uh, um, after one month, after my emotions uh, abated, um, I read the reviews again, and I found that they were not criticizing me. They were criticizing the work I did. These are two different things. Uh, and uh, in my mind, I was uh, combining this. And these reviews, they helped me improve my uh, PhD dissertation. So um, the reviews, uh, the comments we provide, they need to be constructive. Um, how to improve the methodology, what to improve in the literature review. Uh, and also, they, uh, it's good that they are specific. So if we say that the literature review needs an update of sources, uh, if it is very, uh, if the, the sources are really very outdated, we can write uh, just a general comment like 
references need significant update with sources from the last, let's say, five years. But uh, if it is about, uh, but if uh, uh, the problem is not with the uh, uh, with the recency of publications, but with the relevance and the scope of publications, we can pro we can recommend papers to be included there. But of course, we should not recommend only our papers. I, it's not a problem that if we recommend our papers, that's. Uh, uh, but uh, it's a problem if we recommend only our papers or predominantly uh, our papers. Uh, we need to be fair and not to push uh, self promotion and uh, uh, to coerce citations to uh, our publications. Um, regarding the length, because this is also a, a question, it all depends on the paper, but if the paper is going to be revised, something, uh, uh, one page is fine as a review, two pages. I've seen uh, the longest, the longest review I have seen submitted to the European Journal of Tourism Research was submitted seven, eight years ago. It was nine pages nearly 3,000 words. It was extremely detailed. Um, the longest I have prepared was four pages, usually something about one, between one and two pages, so, but sometimes even, so, but most commonly around one pages, one page. Um, so um, also something uh, in the review process, it's good to, uh, it's good to put our uh, it, it's good the review to put uh, him herself in the shoes of the author. Sometimes the problem is not so much with the methodology with the uh, but it's a problem with the writing because uh, I'm not a native speaker in English uh, so uh, and uh, I also find it challenging to express myself uh, but uh, uh, the majority of the authors uh, in English are not uh, native speakers. So it's good to see whether it is a matter of, uh, um, of expression rather than it's a matter of, uh, of, of uh, serious flaws uh, in uh, the paper. But anyway, we, but anyway, papers, uh, before they accept it, they have to be uh, in good quality English. All right. Thank you, Stan. This is very detailed. So um, I actually wanted to ask you a couple of questions which you answered in, in your, um, in you know, when you were answering this. One was about suggesting your own papers in the review. So you said that it's okay as far as they are one relevant, like you are talking about a relevant paper here. Uh, second, exactly. it's not only yeah. your papers or predominantly your papers that you are suggesting so that's good you know i think that um, when it comes to review right and you did talk about uh, constructive comments many times uh, people um, are just criticizing papers and it you know all of us get those reviews where the reviewer is saying this is bad this is bad but there's no constructive comment there like okay maybe sometimes it's a good mm -hmm. idea to suggest something instead of only criticizing, right? Um, I, I want to um, uh, share my own experience with you. Recently, I got, uh, I don't know if I should name the journals or not, but anyways, recently I got a review from um, IJHM. Uh, there were four reviewers and um, three of them perfectly fine. It was very okay to deal with them, even though it's, you know, a pretty good amount of review. For the fourth one, um, I had to write an, uh, an email to the editor asking, I don't understand what the reviewer is asking. Um, so this was one situation. The other one, maybe some of uh, the people who are watching this video, if they are on my Facebook, uh, I recently um, submitted a paper to Cornell Quarterly and I got uh, five reviewers, one editor and one associate editor, seven people commented on that paper. And my response to reviewer comments was more than 14,000 words. It was, I don't know, 23 or 24 pages. Just the response to reviewers. Impressive. Yeah, Impressive. just the response to reviewers, right? But I did not feel bad at all doing all this because all every single comment was constructive. So as a researcher, as an author, it was very fulfilling doing all this, right? Because mm -hmm. you know you're getting something good out of it. So I just want to share this with people who are watching. Um, okay, so Stan, um, you talked about benefits, limitations. You talked very detailed about how to go with the review process and everything. One thing that uh, was missing in your answer, and this is an important question. Um, how important is it to look for the journal that you are reviewing for? 
Sorry, can you uh, please? How, uh, so how important is the journal uh, that uh, you are? How doing? important is the journal? Yes, like sometimes you know, as a PhD student, you don't realize journals and you know predatory journals or journals that are charging authors money or whatever, and then you just feel happy for the first time getting an email from an from a journal to review. Is it an important mm -hmm. thing? Yeah. To look for the quality of the journal or no? Well, it's it is important, but not so much. So uh, uh, first, uh, uh, from my experience, I don't review for predatory journals, and I do not review for mainstream journals who charge authors. So I only, re I personally review only for journals that do not charge authors, regardless whether they are with paid access. Uh, or subscription journals or whether they are open access journals that do not charge authors or readers. Uh, this is first. Uh, second, uh, um, yes, uh, we all feel flattered when we receive invitations from journals with a high impact factor, high site score, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but uh, uh, you know my opinion about these metrics, so that they reflect citations, they don't reflect the quality. Uh, and uh, I also review for many journals which are not indexed in Scopus or in uh, uh, Web of Science. Uh, so um, the question is uh, how you rationalize your time. Because uh, um, uh, I, I'm, I think this year I have made something like 140 reviews and I still have 12 I need to finalize <laughs> before New Year, which is a lot, which is a lot. Uh, if you put two hours on average, you can see 300 hours per year go only uh, only on this. But uh, um, so you you need to uh, you need to prioritize at one point and to say no. But uh, it's good to have. Uh, but it's good to be a reviewer in different journals, uh, in journals which are uh, highly ranked, in journals uh, which are not ranked, uh, in journals that are uh, um, in international journals, in local journals. Etc. Because we do this for the research for the research community, this is uh, this is our uh, payback to the. Research. Because when we submit an article, we expect to receive reviews, but uh, someone needs to write these reviews, and uh, when this someone uh, uh, submits a paper, this that person will receive. Uh, we will expect to receive reviews. So uh, uh, this is the way to pay back. Uh, uh, to the um, to the whole research community, uh, so that's why um, that's why I say that yes, the journal is important, but it not so much important. There are other uh, there may be other criteria uh, that are more important to this. For for example, for me personally, this is the relevance whether I can provide a constructive feedback or not. If someone submits, uh, uh, if uh, someone sends me an invitation to review a medical paper, <laughs> it is completely out of my scope. So definitely, I will decline the invitation. Sometimes, right. uh, sometimes also uh, something that I forgot. This is uh, um, uh, the timeliness of the review. Whether you can provide the feedback in a timely manner. I have. Uh, uh, um, Sometimes I have declined invitations even from uh, top journals just because uh, they will be, I cannot provide uh, feedback uh, in the time frame that they request. Right. So uh, thank you for that, Stan. I have a few questions in the mm -hmm. chat, so I'm going to put them up and then, you know, okay. um, this is a very good question because I've got into a situation with a particular, this particular thing. Uh, many journals ask. Okay. To uh, pre, you know, list the prefer or oppose reviewer names. Uh, in fact, a journal of business research, you cannot submit your paper unless you suggest three reviewers. Now, of mm -hmm. course, from uh, one perspective, it's a way to increase the reviewer pool. It's not mm -hmm. necessary, you know, your paper goes to the same reviewer. Uh, but for the journals where it's an optional thing, right, where it's optional, mm -hmm. not necessary, do you think it's a good thing to do? Well, uh, 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 well, in the European Journal of Tourism Research and in Robonomics, uh, we don't have this requirement 
because uh, uh, because my, my personal belief is that uh, it is the editor's the ultimate decision about acceptance and rejection, and it's uh, editor's ultimate responsibility about the quality of the journal, not reviewers. Reviewers only inform the edit, uh, help the editor take an informed decision. So I have a more, how to say, uh, a little bit uh, more active position in uh, the decision-making process than in other journals. And um, so we don't have this in the EJTR. Uh, I think uh, I think the logic behind having this preferred and the post, uh, actually that they don't have preferred, they have suggested reviewers and the post reviewers, which is a, uh, which is a bit different uh, concept. A post reviewers, that's, that's absolutely clear. There might be conflict of interest, personal conflict, personal conflicts, uh, you know, we are human beings uh, and you don't want uh, your paper to be rejected just because the reviewer identifies who you are, the reviewer hates you and uh, that's it. But uh, uh, suggested reviewers, it's a good idea because uh, first it helps the it helps the editors, especially if we're talking about a paper in a very narrow field. Uh, uh, this is uh, one. The second one, it uh, it may help the editors evaluate whether the authors are practically familiar with the experts in the field, and uh, because uh, uh, because uh, uh, names of uh, rev potential reviewers who are, let's say, uh, how to say, not experts in the field, then probably it will be. Uh, this is not a, this may not be perceived as a good idea by the editors. All right, thank you, Stan. Um, the, another question is uh, from a good friend of mine, uh, Professor Ali Ustaran. He says, "How do we make sure that the paper has the originality?" And this is a very good oh, question because it can come yeah. back to bite you even. <laughs> uh, well, whether it has originality, so. Uh, uh, do you mean by uh, well, uh, originality can be understood in two in two ways. One is about plagiarism, and the second one is about uh, uh, theoretical originality. So, if we talk about uh, about whether the text is original, that's absolutely easy. Uh, there is software that can be used uh, and to check the similarity. Uh, every year, I reject something like 25, 30 papers in the EJTR for plagiarism, and there is no mercy. Uh, um, and uh, some, uh, and in second case of plagiarism, the uh, the authors receive a ban in submission, and they are duly informed. But uh, um, if we talk about the theoretical originality of the paper, this goes to the uh, theoretical contribution of the paper. Well, um, this is. Um, it, it is more difficult to be determined. Sometimes, sometimes it's easy. So, uh, if you uh, because some fields are very narrow, some fields are very narrow. So, uh, if you write about automation in tourism, automation technologies in tourism, there are several hundred papers on the topic. Less than two hundred on uh, robots. Uh, definitely, definitely, probably less than five hundred altogether written in all the journals all the time. But uh, uh, so it's it's easy, but if it is about a topic uh, that relates to, uh, let's say, customer satisfaction or destination branding, where you have thousands or tens of thousands of uh, papers, conference reports, and uh, etc., then it's a little bit more difficult. Here it is the uh, here the authors need to be proactive, and they need to uh, explain. Uh, they need to provide the extremely strong theoretical rationale about the originality of uh, their paper in the introduction. Then in the conclusion, they have to reiterate this as a 100, 150 word take home message about the theoretical contribution. So uh, I hope this helps uh, and uh, all right. So, Stan, uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, you, you said it completely right. So, you know, plagiarism, there are softwares and, you know, all this stuff. However, I want to bring you back to a recent event um, that involved both of us. Uh, you may remember this. 
So in some cases, these softwares are also not accurate, right? So recently, um, for one of the special issues I was editing, I sent you a request to review a paper without mm -hmm. knowing anything be because the paper was about automation and you are one of yes. the leading experts. Um, in Interestingly, that paper we checked through Turnitin and the match was only, I don't know what, 3%, 4%, something like mm -hmm. this, right? So it passed the initial review, we send it to you. And then you got back to me within an hour of the review, obviously very upset because the paper was 99% match to a chapter that was in your book that you yeah. edited. And you got to know this because you edited that book and you knew the book chapter. But if it was somebody else, how would they know that? Because they might not have read the book or saw the book chapter and turn it in is not catching it. So well, yeah, uh, well, practically, I, I know the case <laughs> that I know the case yes. very well. Uh, but uh, uh, what I can say is that uh, not uh, Turnitin is not a uh, universal solution, but uh, because uh, it all depends on what is inside. Sometimes authors, they are very creative and they change words, they change, they, uh, change uh, uh, letters. For example, uh, if, uh, um, you can, if you change uh, uh, O-E in uh, Latin with Cyrillic alphabet, uh, visually they will look the same. The Cyrillic alphabet, which we use in Bulgaria, we created it. We, uh, it will, it will, um, uh, it will uh, look visually absolutely the same in the PDF file, but with the computer, this will be completely different symbols. And uh, the plagiarism, um, the system may not check, may not find this. Uh, usually, uh, you. Um, but when you start reading, uh, it, it's. Um, uh, yeah, here artificial intelligence cannot help, but the human intelligence can help because you can see the changes in the uh, in the style of writing. You, you start reading, uh, you start reading initially, and you see that the, the, the style is a little bit sloppy. But then suddenly, the academic writing is flawless, very high level. So, and the system doesn't check, find this. So probably you can use some. Uh, you, you can check some sentences uh, online, and usually this may uh, this may appear. All right, perfect. So this uh, makes sense. Now, uh, one other idea is also maybe uh, if you get a paper to review, you can also check the title or the abstract in Google um, or Go Google Scholar or Google because sometimes they have different uh, <laughs> indexing, right? So that can also come up with some um, stuff. Uh, all right, so this is great. Um, there are a couple of other questions then um, uh, mm -hmm. we can go through them and then I think we will finish soon. Mm -hmm. uh, one question that I have from another good friend friend of mine, Dr. Sedan, is mm -hmm. uh, what are the most common mistakes that are done by the reviewers? OK, this is a fantastic question. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Sedan, because uh, I have a special lecture in my research methods uh, class, uh, which is the last one, which is common mistakes in the research, which is from the viewpoint of the authors. But I have never thought about common mistakes uh, uh, by the reviewers. What I can say is, um, is that uh, providing only negative comments and over criticizing. Uh, I remember several times uh, uh, when I had to write in the section to the comments to the or to the editor, confidential comments to the editor, that a particular reviewer was over critical uh, to the uh, to the authors. So uh, second, not providing constructive comments or providing comments that are very shallow. And it's like, oh, this is a great paper. Oh, it's fantastic. And that's it. Without uh, seeing that there are some uh, obvious flaws, like the paper is very descriptive, or there's a complete disconnection between the uh, literature review, the methodology, and the results, or, uh, or such things. Uh, or uh, trying to mix um, something that I mentioned uh, before that, mixing uh, uh, criticizing the work with criticizing the personality of uh, of the authors. This 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 uh, uh, there should be a wall between this. We should never, as reviewers, we should never criticize the authors. We should criticize the work, not the authors. And uh, uh, yeah, or I've seen uh, not so often, but uh, when reviewers. Uh, 
uh, overly suggest their own work to uh, uh, to uh, to the author. So when you see uh, five suggestions and uh, uh, four of them are uh, with the same author, or uh, four of them, they, uh, four out of five, they come from the same journal. So probably you, you can uh, uh, you can figure out that it's either the author or someone affiliated to the journal that uh, wants to boost the citations, uh, which is which is not ethical. This is not ethical. All right, thank you, Arsen. Um, uh, there are obviously a few other questions, but I'm going to go with the most important mm -hmm. ones. Uh, this one is an interesting one that says that, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, several journals have different type of criteria for the reviewers, right? And uh, why the journals do not let the reviewer amend or comment straightforward. Um, so I just want to add something here. So for instance, when you review something for Emerald Journal. So mm -hmm. Emerald has like a set form. So there's like different type of forms. Um, probably mm -hmm. this is what this question is talking about. So what, yeah. what do you? Uh, well, uh, when I review for Emerald and I write many reviews for their journals, uh, some uh, I, write, uh, uh, I, I write in my own format, <laughs> in the sandwich format that I mentioned, general positive comments, uh, then negative comments and then uh, a summary, uh, the, then the uh, the recommendation. But uh, uh, and I put this in the free text uh, comment. In the other section, I just uh, write with few words, uh, excellent, well done, or see below, or this is a weakness. See comments uh, below, or something like this. Practically, this structured abstract is there to help the reviewers. Uh, uh, in the European Journal of Tourism Research and in Robonomics, uh, we don't have structured uh, we don't have structured reviews, so it is it is free text format. But uh, uh, some of you may remember uh, those of you that have reviewed for the EJTR before we launched the system in July, we had uh, a score a scorecard for the different sections, uh, which is uh, uh, which is also. Uh, a type of structured uh, review, providing comments to the different uh, sections. But uh, this, it, this is there for, for uh, to help the reviewers, not to uh, not to hinder them. But anyway, you can write uh, all your review in the uh, co uh, general comments to the authors, and in the other section, just to write CB wall. That's it. Um, all right, so this is good. Yeah, I normally do the same. I mean, I um, write the review and then put it into the comments to the author because sometimes there's like a free text place. And then for the other places where it's like structured, I just say, please see my comments or something like this. Mm -hmm. So that's completely okay. Um, all right, so another question that we have, uh, one question you will like a lot, I'll not put it on the screen, I'll keep it to the end. But this one, um, so this question actually, these are two comments. Uh, the first one says that normally when uh, you get an invitation to review, uh, the abstract is sent to you, right? Uh, and this abstract sometimes is 150 words or 200 words. Uh, so how do you do this? Because you don't know the subject or yeah. methodology in detail. Yeah, I completely agree. Sometimes I have received, for example, uh, papers uh, to review on uh, service robots. Uh, the methodology, I, uh, which you use a methodology which is uh, I, which I'm not uh, in, uh, it, it's it's not my strength. What, what I do is I focus on the other sections, on all the other sections, and uh, I explicitly write in my comment to the editor or in the review that uh, I do not comment on the uh, on the methodology because. Uh, uh, because it's uh, outside of my expertise. All right, per perfect. Thank you. So, Stan, uh, two smaller questions very quickly. Okay. One is um, this one, which is that uh, before submitting, if you check it by yourself and turn it in, it's going to show 100% to the editor how to solve this. Uh, well, uh, there is a, so, uh, um, a solution. Uh, the editor, uh, uh, well, first, the author should not do this. Be uh, they should use a sandbox in the system, in Turnitin, uh, uh, where the system, uh, where the Turnitin, uh, where the manuscript will go to be checked in Turnitin, but it will not be kept in the repository in Turnitin. Mm -hmm. 
This is first. Second, if they if the authors have made the mistake to check it through Turnitin, the uh, the editor can exclude this source and uh, uh, can exclude this source from uh, from the similarity report and uh, use uh, use the other uh, and check the other sources. They will also appear there. All right, thank you. So, Stan, another related question is, what is the acceptable similarity rate in Turnitin? And, and this is a good one because, uh, you know, when you are studying for PhD, then the universities normally have 20%. Yeah. Authors go with the yeah. same perception to journals. Well, how is it in EJTR? Uh, what do you think? Well, there is no such thing as acceptable similarity rate. It all depends. So, when I uh, when I check the papers in EJTR or in... Uh, uh, for other submissions, which uh, I have a suspicion that uh, uh, the day is plagiarism, what I uh, well I will upload the whole papers, uh, so which means that the, the references are also there, which means that uh, it is possible that uh, 20 25 percent of similarity come from the references. So this is disregarded. However, uh, uh, I look only on the main text. There should be no chunks of text. That are uh, that are coming from elsewhere, and uh, so if it is uh, uh, half a sentence, if it is a few words, that's absolutely no problem. If it is a direct quote, no problem because it's a direct quote. There is a reference provided, etc. But if there is a whole sentence or a paragraph, there is no mercy after that. So practically, I never look at uh, the number. The number of uh, this, the similarity is just an indication that there is a high similarity it's not an indication of plagiarism so um yeah right also i think stan uh, uh, it also depends on the discipline academic discipline right so if you are like let's say studying law or something where you have to put the clauses from the law or constitution you can't paraphrase them you can't rephrase them so of course yes. there will be high similarity there uh, i also think that many journals where they ask you to be below 15 percent or whatever they still say that um, uh, each uh, similarity should be less than 1%. So that 1% yes. levy is for you to have that similarity there. But anyways, it's a good. So one thing is from Sedan, just to make you a bit happier. Uh, she says, may the academic force be with you. So that is <laughs> for you. Echeculaire, Sedan. Echeculaire. <laughs> Last question um, is from, again, from Professor Ali Ostaran. This is a good one. I have a personal interest in this one. What is your perception towards the sustainability journal? MPDI. Yes. I don't review, I don't surf in the board, and I don't publish. So I, um, because the journal, the journal may be good, but it goes beyond my ethical perceptions. I, I, I think that authors should not pay for their publications because authors do all the work they collect the data, they analyze the data, they even obtain the, uh, the funding while the journals, uh, uh, editors work for free, reviewers review for free, and the journals are taking thousands of euros just uh, for, for work which is practically not, uh, uh, which is done by someone else who works for free. I don't think that this is ethical. It is legal, but it's not ethical. In, uh, that's why I don't... Uh, uh, do anything for the journal. I used to do, let's say, a few years, a uh, few years ago, but then I saw that uh, it's it's not my field. Right. So I just want to um, highlight here a little bit, Stan, and uh, I like your answer. You said it's um, legal, but in your opinion, it's not ethical, right? So yes. uh, I just want to say that recently I read a, about the sustainability journal on Trinet. I think there was a discussion going on. Yes. And uh, one of the editors said that he likes it because uh, um, sustainability MDPI, they do all the stuff and editor only does the decision making, which is a different model, right? But I agree to this because I feel uh, that if all the journals were charging and then this journal is charging less or whatever, then it would be a different um, issue. But right now we have several completely open access journals like EJTR is completely mm -hmm. open access. Yeah. It's completely free for uh, authors to submit exactly. all, all the stuff. Um, Jehan, I want to highlight completely open access journals he is working on. Uh, so there is an opportunity. So why then authors have to pay 1700 or 1800 
uh, dollars or Swiss francs or whatever. Um, I also want to comment uh, a couple of other people here. So sustainability journal, I think they say that they charge because they want to make it pretty quick. So within a couple of weeks, you get your decision and everything is quicker. I think there are a lot of journals that are for profit journals like by Emerald or um, by elsewhere. But the editors have developed systems like I want to highlight Professor Dimitros Buhales. He has a team of associate editors, right? Um, and the reason for that team is because as soon as the paper comes, then it's sent to the associate editor to deal with it. And um, many times you get your first decision within uh, three to four weeks. So I think um, authors sometimes also are lazy not to find the right outlet to publish their papers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's it's um, just a different model, but I think uh, people should look at different opportunities before going for completely for-profit mm -hmm. journals. All right, um, any last suggestions um, uh, from you, Stan, for people who want to be, or, or let me rephrase my question. So uh, you get a reviewer report, okay, as an editor, from mm -hmm. uh, a young reviewer, maybe reviewing for you for the first time, what do you see in that mm -hmm. report? What what would I? What what do you see? Like, what is it that you really look for in that report? In the report, I look yeah. whether the comments are constructive, whether they are relevant, whether uh, um, whether the comments will help the authors uh, improve the paper. Uh, because if the paper is, uh, well, I usually desk reject something like 80% of submissions, which means that uh, uh, this, uh, that if the paper is sent out of, uh, for review, it has some merits. It has some merits and uh, it doesn't mean that the paper cannot be rejected. It can be uh, rejected, but it uh, has some merits. So I'm looking for uh, whether the paper can be improved or if there are significant uh, flaws. And... Uh, also, uh, not. I don't expect ten pages of review, but uh, 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 but also something uh, a few hundred words uh, that can help the that can help the authors. All right, thank you very much, Stan. I really, really appreciate thank your time. But before we sign off, I just have a couple of quick announcements. Um, I al already shared it on Facebook, but I want to say that um, uh, you know I'm doing all this stuff to try to help many betting researchers because the help is very limited to many people around the world. Um, so I'm starting a newsletter for um, graduate students and I urge you, Stan, and any other, like Professor Ali Osteran or Dr. Sedan or any other uh, experienced people who are watching to help me with contributing to this uh, newsletter. And the basic idea for this newsletter is to highlight uh, some important methodologies, some tips and tricks, just like this, how to review papers or any issues with researchers. And if you have any students who have um, done an amazing job, like beyond all the limitations and everything, some motivational stuff, right? Um, share with me and I'll be happy to uh, feature that in that newsletter completely free. Um, and if you are doing any workshops, uh, any talks, any webinars where people can join for free, uh, send all that to me so I can feature it in the newsletter. Um, and then the, the other thing is that 19th of December, I'll share this on my social media also. 19th of December morning, I have a three hours long session for NVivo. So I have a, a certified trainer who will come and talk about NVivo. Uh, and it's completely free. Nobody has to pay anything for any of this. So thank you again, Stan. Thank you, everybody who was watching. I hope this was valuable to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.